thank you very much. This is certainly a high honor to, to be here and uh, <coughs> talk about geotechnics for the world's tallest uh, buildings. Uh, this is going to be from my geotechnical perspective and based on my uh, personal experience uh, over the years. The actual uh, title of the PowerPoint, Design of Foundations for the World's Tallest Buildings, and uh, my associate, Tony Keeper, uh, helped me with this. <clears throat> and there are certain essentially requirements that we feel, uh, we feel are necessary. Uh, the primary one from our point of view is a good communication between the structural engineer and the geotechnical engineer. We have to work as a team and we have to uh, have confidence in each other's uh, uh, abilities and, and expertise. Uh, we need to plan the uh, subsurface uh, exploration program together, or at least both have input in the uh, planning. And the, pr the approach is to do uh, borings for, regular borings for general stratigraphy, and then select borings for the special testing, the in-situ testing, um, such as cone and, and uh, dilatometer, and then uh, the shear wave velocity for site-specific analysis, and then uh, special laboratory tracks and consolidation tests. Of course, uh, what are we interested in from the foundation point of view? Uh, settlement prediction and uh, bearing capacity analysis. In my experience, it's helpful to do a simple analysis first uh, based on your experience and then uh, do more uh, uh, complete uh, finite element uh, analyses. But being able to do a quick, uh, simple analysis gives you the right ballpark you're going to be in. And we have to have instrumented load test programs. Uh, done in advance of construction so that you can uh, uh, take advantage of them in the design. And there are different types of uh, load test programs that are listed here. Uh, there's the conventional uh, tie-down type test. This is actually at uh, uh, what was then Burj Dubai, it's now Burj Khalifa, 6,000 ton uh, tie-down load test. Uh, another type is the deadweight type. Uh, this is a 3,000 ton a deadweight test in uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur up at Petronas Towers. And then we have the Osterberg O-cell test. This is just a jack uh, that you can push up and down at the same time. You can position it at the bottom of the shaft or some intermediate point. And with the proper instrumentation, you can determine an awful lot of information from this test. And then there are dynamic tests. Um, you ha it's just like uh, Pile driving, this is a big weight, a huge weight uh, uh, dropped on a shaft, instrumented shaft to determine uh, the response properties and from that you can predict uh, the capacity. <clears throat> and then finally, what's called the statnamic test. This is a little different. You actually are lifting a weight uh, with gas pressure and the gas pressure is on long enough so that it's different from sending a shock wave down the shaft, you're actually pushing the foundation element as a, as a unit down and you get uh, properly instrumentation, uh, you get very good information from this type of test. And then we need to uh, have good construction monitoring uh, and both during the excavation of the test shafts and uh, monitoring of the load test and then of course during the actual uh, production shaft work. <clears throat> and it's important to remember uh, when operating at the limit of past experience, and we're doing that all the time with these super tall buildings, we need to take small steps <laughs> and if large step is necessary, be more conservative. And we need to go through the what ifs and have a plan B ready if poor performance exceeds acceptable limits. Assume but verify. If not possible to verify, then above are especially important. What types of foundations do we have for very tall buildings? Well, there's a list here. Matter or footings on rock, I've listed some types, uh, examples. Piles to bearing, and the piles, there are different piles, and there are board piles, uh, and uh, extended to bearing. Uh, and then there's a combination mat and piles together. 
uh, using either drill shafts or barrettes as, as, the, uh, as the pile, using piles, drill shafts, or barrettes. Some principles to remember. Uh, this is important for geotech and structural engineers. There is no geotechnical limit to friction piles. Friction piles can be made long enough so that structural capacity governs, provided the friction deposit is deep enough and you can drill deeper. <clears throat> uh, for a mat on friction piles of similar material, the load will be shared between the mat and the piles based on the relative modulus and area based on calculations for compression in the piles and compression in the soil, including the zone of significant stress below the piles. Where the ground alone is strong enough to support the building with mat only, but settlement is the issue, the purpose of the piles is primarily to, primarily to reduce the settlement, i.e. stiffen the ground. The longer the piles, the less the settlement, as more of the stress bulb is in the stiffened ground. Uh, these are some additional comments and advice that I take personally. We may not be as smart as we think we are, and things are not always what they seem to be. So, know and make use of your local geology. It's very important. Know and calibrate to any local documented case histories and similar geology. When operating at the limit of past experience, take small steps. <coughs> I also should add in here, talk to the knowledgeable contractors in the area. I've learned as an engineer, the contractors often know a lot more uh, than we uh, geotechnical engineers. They know what's buildable, and they know what they have had success with. Uh, I was asked what was my most challenging uh, uh, project, and I still consider Patronus Towers my most challenging project <coughs> as a geotechnical engineer. And the owner initially wanted uh, zero differential settlement, and the site he has picked was over a canyon, uh, over a karstic limestone full of caves. And, uh, you know, we, the structural engineer, we told him, yeah, that's impossible. Uh, so uh, finally he said, okay, the design criteria will be a half inch maximum differential settlement across the width of the mat. And these are connected towers. And so, uh, based on a lot of testing, we felt that it could be done, and uh, it was done by varying the length of the piles and keeping them in the overburden above the, above the uh, actual um, uh, limestone, which we never did find at, at its deepest point in the canyon. Uh, but we did also uh, undertake a, an extensive grouting program to fill the voids in the, in the um, limestone uh, to minimize the settlement from that particular uh, cause. Uh, the pressure meter test, I'm just showing a quick uh, picture of it here. Uh, we use it a lot. It's an in-the-ground test. You can put test at any point in the depth of your boring. Uh, it's a laterally expandable probe. It expands laterally, and you measure the pressure and the volume change. And from this information, you get you plot up the data, and you can get this information. You can get uh, ultimate uh, capacity information, and we uh, get a lot of information from this from properly run tests. Uh, I think I'm, I just talked about the Petronas towers. I don't think I need to go. This is more for geotechnical uh, engineers. Uh, but the concept is to vary the length of the piles uh, to reduce the, uh, to control the differential settlement. How did we do? Well, we predicted the settlements, and uh, uh, the actual settlement uh, turned out to be less than, or about half of we, what we predicted. We were predicting settlements based on all of the test data, and we did have a couple of advanced load tests uh, at around 35 millimeters. And it actually, I mean, at around 65 millimeters, and it actually settled only about 35 millimeters. And there are papers explaining what might be the difference, what reasons why we don't need to go into that here. Uh, here's a picture of Petronas Towers. I love this picture because it shows the, uh, uh, the connecting bridge, and uh, it's a challenging job. 
the structural engineers came up with a solution. Um, the bridge is fixed on one side, and then telescopes in and out of the tower on the other side. My wife and I have actually walked on that bridge. I will say not on a day that was windy enough so that we could observe the in and out movement, but it is a, it's an outstanding uh, experience anyway. Another uh, example of uh, tall buildings, this uh, I guess is currently the, large, uh, the uh, tallest, uh, uh, the tallest in, the, in the world right now, Burj Khalifa. Uh, we just had a minor uh, peer review role on this for the architect, when we were one of the peer reviewers. <coughs> Uh, these slides come from the architect and from the local geotechnical engineer, Hyder. Uh, but you can see uh, the design. Uh, it's a very stiff, stiff uh, uh, three-wing design. And uh, it's reinforced concrete all the way up to it, it transitions to steel at the, stop, at the top. Uh, it has a thick mat, and it's uh, supported on um, these... Uh, uh, board piles uh, extended down uh, d d to a depth determined by the settlement calculations. <clears throat> I, I'm, this is a simple analysis uh, for geotechs. It's interesting. Uh, it's a block analysis. You uh, you can actually, uh, with the data, the simple data that you collect, you can actually predict uh, how it's going to uh, perform if it's a stiff building. You can use average data and assume that the block is going to settle as a unit, do your simple calculations, and actually calculate what is going to happen. Uh, we were actually very fortunate in this one. We predicted it just as well as the, as the fancy uh, computer analyses did. Uh, but this is what it looks like. You can see you've got to convert that <coughs> uh, three-wing shape into an equivalent block and uh, uh, use your average data. You can't predict the kind of differential that you can with the proper finite element program, uh, which uh, Hydra, the geotech, did. And you can see um, uh, th their results. Uh, they, we predicted similar uh, ma maximum settlements. They, of course, could predict with the finite element programs how the settlement varied as you went away from the tower. All right. <coughs> I want to also uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Chicago experience because we have had some very tall buildings here and I, I've uh, done my learning experience here. I've learned by uh, following others. Uh, you, you, uh, you use past experience and you build on, on past experience and that's what we've done here in Chicago. Uh, this is an example of one of the, the tallest buildings built right after the World War II. Um, Lake Point Towers, I think, is about 65 stories. And it was built before we had the in-situ pressure meter testing, uh, the foundation, uh, the geotechnical properties for, for the foundation design uh, were based on laboratory traxial compression testing. <coughs> uh, this is the water tower project. Uh, it's a 75-story reinforced concrete. <coughs> and uh, this is one that where the settlement was uh, predicted uh, based on the pressure meter testing that's supported on belt caissons down in the hard pan, and we, we hit it right on the money. As to, that gives you a lot of confidence in your testing procedure if you can, if you can be right on a major project like, like this. Uh, this is an example of uh, the Osterberg load cell uh, test, uh, which was used on uh, more recent projects. <coughs> And you can see the cell, the cell beneath the, uh, at the bottom. This is a cell that's going to test the, uh, the, uh, the bearing. Uh, one of the recent uh, projects, very impressive one where the Osterberg, uh, the old cell was used was the Trump uh, Tower. And on this one, uh, we were able to confirm an allowable bearing pressure of uh, 270 tons per square foot, maximum a code allowable in Chicago for uh, shafts expended, extended six foot into the uh, dolomite is uh, 200 tons per square foot. And then this is the Chicago Spire. Uh, very pretty picture. Hasn't gotten built yet. <laughs> but on this one, uh, and a lot of money in the ground already. Foundations are all in for a super tall building. And on this one, using the Osterberg uh, load cell, 
we were able to, able to confirm allowable bearing of 300 tons per square foot. This is a picture of it currently, or not, maybe a little cleaned up, but that's generally the picture of it. Uh, the, uh, it's all the foundations are in, and it's ready for this super tall building if somebody comes up with the money. All of you developers out there, there you are. Uh, now this is another, this is a project where we also uh, use the uh, O-cell. Uh, and here, um, trying to, you know, always try to save money if you can, um, testing uh, the surface of the fractured uh, dolomite rather than having to dig into it. How good is the surface of it? Well, there's no code allowable for that. Uh, in, in the old days, probably the bearing uh, on hand dug caissons down to that level was uh, 30 tons per square foot. Now, using the uh, pressure, uh, the um, Osterberg load cell, we're able to uh, confirm uh, bearing pressures on the surface of the rock, of uh, the surface of the fracture rock, 90 tons per square foot. So that's um, a major advance, of course. <clears throat> so, in conclusion. Utilizing the in-situ pressure meter test and empirical cal uh, calculations, bearing capacity procedures, and by observing building performance over time, this is very, we've been very fortunate here in that regard. We have been successful in increasing allowable bearing pressures on good Chicago hardpan from dense glacial till, I mean, that's what the hardpan is, very dense glacial till, from 12 KSF to 50 KSF on major high-rise projects and with re reliably predicted settlement. And utilizing the Osterberg uh, load cell, we have been able to increase maximum allowable dolomite rock bearing pressures from 200 tons per square foot to 300 tons per square foot. And as already mentioned, from surface of rock from 30 to, uh, uh, to 90. Thank you very much.